Uh, I'm, I am a local organizer. I have been here in Charlotte organizing for the past three years. Um, part of what activated me was the Trayvon Martin case and also the Jonathan Farrell case, which happened that same summer in 2013. Um, I rose to, to national prominence and recognition because I scaled the flagpole in South Carolina and removed the Confederate flag. <laughs> Prepared. I really am here just to stand with my community, to stand with the victims um, and their families uh, of, of police brutality. Um, in the wake of, you know, traveling, uh, of taking down the flag, I've gotten a lot of invitations to travel around the country and speak. And one of the most questions, one of the questions I get asked the most is, you know, what do I do to become an activist? How do I become an activist? And that's one of the hardest questions to answer because the, the truth is I don't think you become an activist. I don't think uh, a, a, a activist is something that you aspire to do. It's something that you do because you have to do it. It's because there's a moment that makes you aware. Now I, I am fortunately, uh, in my family, I have not experienced police brutality in the way that the families standing up here have, but I have experienced racist violence. Um, there's a great uncle in my family who was lynched in Goldsboro, North Carolina. My grandmother, who grew up in Greenville, South Carolina, which the, watched the Ku Klux Klan drag her neighbor from his house and beat him because he was a black physician who treated a white woman. I am descended from people who were brought in chains through Charleston, South Carolina, who were enslaved in the Carolinas uh, up until emancipation. And what we know is that once emancipation happened, this, the original chattel slavery system was just replaced with a new system called the prison industrial complex. And that's the larger issue that we are dealing with here. Now, I've, I have spoken here many times. I can't even tell you how many rallies I have attended in Marshall Park. I can't tell you how many times I've been called up to speak, and I have, and I will continue to speak. But I have to tell you, like the first person who spoke, I too am tired. I'm tired of coming to explain reality, a reality that has existed for 400 years here. I'm tired of, of explaining this reality of what it is to be black, of this struggle for black life that began not this past week. When they talk about people being out in the streets marching in Baton Rouge, they're not responding to just what happened to Alton Sterling. They're responding to a reality that has existed for 400 years. They are resisting in a movement of resistance that began when the first ships kidnapped Africans and dragged them from their shores. That is the larger context for what we're talking about here, and that is important to understand because as we are looking for solutions, we have to understand what we're talking about. We're talking about systems. Systems at every level that just begin. So, so when we're looking at an instance where we have police brutality between a police officer, a police officer has an interaction with a community member that turns violent, that's just the first level of that violence. That's just the immediate, the most immediate form of state violence. But that individual, that individual, like uh, Jeremy Williams, who, Jerry Williams, excuse me, I, I don't want to say the name wrong, Jeremy Williams, who was killed up in Asheville. He was killed up in uh, Deaverview, if I'm not mistaken, if anybody's from Asheville, correct me if I'm wrong, I was just up there talking to them. He was killed near Deaverview Projects. Now, Deaverview Projects, this is a place that, like many urban areas around the nation, was redlined in the 60s to segregate people of color into concentrated areas of, areas of poverty while the city dis disinvested from those communities in education, in health care, in transportation, in every aspect of black life, including mental health services, and then, to, and then just police that area. So they throw police as a, as a solution to every issue that they are refusing to solve. We know the solutions. The solutions are not difficult. People have been marching on this issue since at least the 60s on police brutality. You can go back and see Martin Luther King talking about police brutality. People keep saying, well, what would King say today? We know what King would say today because he was saying it in 1963. So, so let's stop talking about what King was talking about in 1963. Let's talk about what we're going to do today. We need police accountability now. The first thing they need to do, every police officer who has complaints, or has over five complaints, needs to be flagged and put on desk duty right now. And I, I am for, I'm for legislative change. I'm all for pushing that. But we have to understand that the only thing that has really brought us to this point has been organized resistance. Organ and I, I stand for nonviolence, but it has. But you have to understand that nonviolence is not about passivity at all. It's not about passivity. Nonviolence has always been about shutting things down. Okay, I, I stand up when I jumped into this movement. I recognized that I was coming into a movement for human rights that has existed for hundreds of years. 
okay? And one of the things that folks like Gandhi, folks like MLK, folks like all these people that they that they lift up and tell us that we should be looking to um, for, for guidance as these young people out here organizing, they shut things down. And that's what you have to do to move. We have to, coming here together is wonderful. This is an important gathering. This is a space for mourning. This is a space for getting information out. This is a space for coming together and healing. But in terms of making change, that has to be organized. I'll say this one last thing. I don't believe in organizations. I believe in the people being organized. Those are two different things. Let me explain it. That's not to say that there's anything wrong with organizations. This rally right here was organized by two different organizations coming together. But the, but the difference is that this gathering right here, this is what the people organized looks like. Whatever organizations that we need to exist in order to meet the need, the needs of the people will come about from the people organizing. It may not be the Democrats and the Republicans. Okay? We don't know what it might be. But it begins with us coming together and identifying specifically what things need to change. And then we must mount resistance to push for that change because, as Frederick Douglass says, power concedes nothing without a demand. So after we lay out our grief, after we lay out our grief, after we lay out these stats, after we lay out things like the fact that police killings are at the lowest rate that they have been in 35 years, there have been fewer killing, police killings under President Obama than any other administration. It's just important that you understand this. Now, I agree with everyone. As I said, I am for nonviolence, but we need to understand reality. Because the only way that we are going to move forward towards toward solutions is to begin within a context of reality. And the reality is that more civilians have been killed by police this year alone than the total number of police deaths in this country since the Reagan administration began in 1981. Okay? Sorry? 125 this year alone. So, that's I'm sorry, 125. I'm on. There have been over 500 civilians total killed by police, okay? So, that is a policing crisis in this country. So, after we do this of laying out our grief, of laying out these stats and everything, now we have to lay out our demands and our plan for resistance. Peace to you. Thank you.